Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. This week's presentation features expert Thomas Finn, Medigate's Director of Market Development. Tom will discuss how funding for medical device security projects is exploding, despite HDOs being short on appropriately experienced staff. As a result, a new resource blend is emerging. It combines the skill sets of biomed, IT security, and clinical engineering. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Medigate. Medigate is the industry's first and leading dedicated medical device security and asset management platform, enabling providers to deliver secure, connected care. Medigate fuses the knowledge and understanding of medical workflow and device identity and protocols with the reality of today's cybersecurity threats. With Medigate, hospital networks can safely operate all medical devices on their network, enabling deployment of existing and new devices to patients while ensuring privacy and safety. For more information, please visit Medigate.io. A few announcements before we get started. MD Expo strives to provide healthcare technology management professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. Please join us in Las Vegas on November 1st and 2nd for the 2021 MD Expo. Please visit mdexposhow.com for details, registration, and our steps to a safe and clean meeting environment. While you're there, please make sure to sign up for our newsletter so you'll always have the most up-to-date information. Let's give one lucky attendee the opportunity to win one of our fun new Webinar Wednesday shirts by answering the following question. Medigate recently received which award in recognition as a software and services company that excels in helping healthcare professionals improve patient care? You can find the answer by visiting our sponsor's website. Please use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar dashboard to submit your answer. As always, today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. More details on this at the end of today's webinar. We will wrap up today with a live Q&A. You can submit your questions anytime by using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get through as many questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speaker today is Tom Finn. You may begin whenever you are ready, Tom. Well, thanks so much and uh, welcome everyone. We've got a uh, pretty big group today, so I'm going to try and leave plenty of time for questions at the end. I also uh, want to level set uh, at the beginning of this presentation right now is depending on where you work and how you're staffed, the roles and responsibilities of, for example, clinical engineers, biomed professionals, information security specialists, let's just say the folks that you know, comprise your IT and technology management organizations differ from place to place. In fact, the titles and roles are often used interchangeably. So for today, when I reference clinical engineering, I see it as a uh, specialty within biomedical engineering that these individuals are employed, uh, you know, with the specific goal to advance care through actively supporting the application of technology. But on the uh, biomed side where um, there are many types of engineers and technicians that fall under its umbrella, uh, I'm going to refer uh, to this area as the professional who installs and maintains medical equipment, tests and calibrates it, approves new equipment, teaches others how to use it, maintains maintenance records, uh, evaluate service contracts, and importantly, is charged in the processes associated with keeping patient health information confidential and safe. That said, let's put the role definitions to the side for a moment and talk about what's happening out there in connected health. Advances in the development of connected medical devices has been incredible in recent decades. And I think it's fair that the US can claim to be a leader in the field because we've got great scientists, a well-developed venture capital market, and we spend huge amounts of tax money on the associated R&D. Remarkably, however, 
the operations side of the house, operations research, has long been the neglected uh, stepchild in U.S. healthcare, and it shows. Traditionally, Congress budgeted only a pittance for the operations research required to make our delivery system safer and more efficient. And the private sector is also underinvested because the benefits of their early stage investments often accrued to competitors who were not bearing the initial costs. But all of that has changed very quickly. Uh, the shift from fee for service to value-based care, I think is now uh, safely known as the driver. Uh, the private IT sector is now all in and so are the health systems. <clears throat> Operations are transforming because the reimbursement carrot is moving to a place that compels it. For example, in the solution market where Medigate plays, well, you know, cyber security attacks simply have got to be dealt with. It's becoming, um, you know, a matter of compliance. The, the costs are devastating and it is regarded as a patient safety issue. An integrated approach to medical device security and asset management has emerged as the best practice and not surprisingly, we're seeing hybrid roles emerge as a response. So if we go back to the title here, what is the medical device security engineer? What, is, what does it mean? Well, the short answer is, and my bet would be that a lot of folks attending this presentation today are already doing some of the job. Uh, but a formal definition that I can offer is that a, a medical device security engineer should probably have a background in both biomedical devices and enterprise cybersecurity and should be responsible for interfacing with you know, any of the departments that impact the definition, communication, and enforcement of medical device security policy. Uh, we can come up with another hybrid title and we can create another definition. The point of this presentation today is things are changing, roles are evolving. So, I have to uh, say, well, how would I put this? Let's take a step back and recognize how successful the database vendors were in separating us into silos. Uh, across these three particular silos, which I think grew naturally from the requirements of IT and information security, uh, the demands of biomed and clinical engineering, and the needs of business and finance, uh, which I think is very much inclusive of supply chain now. We're certainly seeing them emerge as a stakeholder. And despite the fact that these three very different personas are critical stakeholders who share the same common vision of patient safety and improved outcomes, uh, let's face it, they just have a very different lens through which they see or have seen the world. Medigate knows that these groups can be united by technology and processes that drive badly needed interoperability. And we also think that given the staffing shortages that plague the industry, everyone is now recognizing that technology that can unify um, these silos are becoming a requirement. At a bare minimum, security practice must be infused into the workflows of technology management professionals, but I really do think it's more than that because our industry really doesn't have the pieces in place to support transformation at the staffing level. Something has got to give. Now, if we take a look at these statistics um, that I've researched, um, I have to tell you, they were not very consistent. The numbers were all over the place. So I went out of my way to select the most conservative the most conservative numbers well you know projecting a need for i've seen 5000 to 10000 uh new uh technology management workers uh by two by 2024 um that's the the thought doesn't sound all that down, daunting the the fact that only 400 new biomed engineering professionals are graduating each year and that the current average age of technicians is 54 is in fact a cause for alarm. Uh, the good news is the current workforce would seem to be highly uh, versatile and experienced. Uh, but if more are retiring each year than can be hired, 
and patient demand is increasing at the same time, which it is, and the demands of these positions are changing, uh, there's obviously a problem. Uh, for starters, you know, the math doesn't even work. Now, if we look on the IT side, the numbers are far more startling, especially when considering that in information security alone, the shortage is predicted to be 1.8 million. Uh, the reasons for this don't surprise either. Uh, not being able to find qualified people, develop them, and retain them is a function of several things. Um, the fact that business conditions don't support existing staff, let alone the hiring of anyone new, is pretty much the crux of it. And when you consider that there doesn't seem to be any clear career path for the information security worker, a factor that also applies to technology management professionals, it's not a good dynamic. Put simply, there's plenty of evidence indicating that hospital leadership's understanding of these problems has lagged behind reality, and they know it's caused a problem because when they're surveyed, they admit it. So, yes, multiple surveys now say that about 42% uh, of hospitals are launching initiatives aimed at bridging the talent gap. Uh, the National Apprenticeship, Apprenticeship Act has stoked investments in apprenticeships, <clears throat> and these investments not only pay off for workers and employers, but naturally they also benefit taxpayers. Upskilling and reskilling are the most powerful ways to gain the required leverage, and, and the time for that is right, as new operationally focused technologies are being rapidly adopted now by health systems. Uh, while perhaps self-serving for me to emphasize the technology dimension, <clears throat> I think it would be remiss of me uh, to not stress how antithetical operational dysfunction is to solving the talent shortage. So the tech uh, investment dimension here is absolutely critical. None of us want our days mired in outdated manual routines when the tech is available to eliminate a lot of it and free us up to pursue more meaningful work. And more meaningful work is clarifying, especially from a career path perspective. In terms of professional conversions, tech is a linchpin for all kinds of reasons, and I will cover several of them going forward, but for now, stay with me and know that if cross-functional operational workflows can reference relevant cuts of the same information. If everyone cross-departmentally is able to sing from the same sheet of music, uh, then operational leverage is gained and professional conversions happens naturally. Uh, put another way, upskilling happens by default in the best possible way. Speaking of that same sheet of music, uh, let me take a uh, quick drink of water here. It all begins with an enlightened understanding of what visibility these days has to mean. An enlightened and common definition of visibility has got to finally be embraced cross-departmentally. The underlying data foundation or the reference architecture must be comprehensive and it's got to be relevant across traditionally siloed staff and their established workflows. For the biomed professional charged with executing a product recall, it means knowing device type, recalled serial numbers, location and device status, for example, are the recalled devices still in patient use? For the information security professional charged with remediating an OS vulnerability, uh, the location of devices running the vulnerable OS version must be identified in the risk and security posture of potentially impacted devices must be available to guide action. For the network security professional tackling, let's say, a, a, a segmentation initiative, the operating requirements of each device must be known. Authorized device behavior must be known in order for unauthorized behavior to be detected. Supply chain professionals have got to understand device utilization as well, because when they do, they're in a position to help improve capital planning, supplier selection, and service level agreements. 
Average utilization in healthcare, as we know, runs low. Uh, the stats say about 43%. So there is significant business value in any reasonable improvement. Uh, let's go to SOC. For SOC teams to accurately detect vulnerabilities and threats and appropriately respond, correct device identifications and an understanding of authorized device behavior is also essential context. Biomed personnel charged with um, maintaining devices, excuse me for a second. Biomed uh, personnel that are charged with maintenance, uh, for example, have got to understand utilization to enable, and this is a big one, enable alternative equipment uh, maintenance programs. Shifting from elapsed time, for example, time-based interventions to utilization is recognized as a huge economic win for all systems. So we've got to get a handle around a common definition, an enlightened definition of visibility. Uh, but I'll tell you what, that real-time inventory, um, which is the way in which the visibility is delivered, is meaningless unless the right cuts of the underlying data are effectively orchestrated to the benefit of the entire ecosystem. Uh, we're referring to it as a converged ecosystem because frankly, the data don't just move in one direction from one source. Um, this is definitely a better together story. For example, uh, through integration with vulnerability management, uh, Medigate provides scanning administrators the identity, location, and stati status of devices that they want to scan, and that's huge. Uh, in turn, however, Medigate receives back the results of the scans and can update the risk scores that it holds and maintains. Uh, let me pick another one. Through integration with CrowdStrike, which uh, gathers its information from agents on managed devices, Medigate can grab those details and add it to the profiles that it manages. In turn, CrowdStrike learns about the agentless unmanaged devices from Medigate, and it also benefits our threat intelligence and network-based monitoring capabilities. Uh, through our integration with ServiceNow, I'll give you one more. Medigate data has been passed to CMMS systems, uh, which then can provide it to CMDB, allowing both systems to automatically trigger work orders and make assignments to the right individuals. Importantly, regardless of which system, CMDB or CMMS, <clears throat> triggers the work order, the results are updated in each system. The point is a single source of truth, truth here drives interoperability, and if we're driving operational conversions, that upskilled professional conversions will also happen naturally. So, what is required to solve the problem? Well, obviously, as it's, as it's become now cliche, it's about people, uh, processes, and technology. And because people and tech drive process development, especially given how relatively green the field is in healthcare that is presented to vendors, uh, we're going to focus here. Um, now, if we look at the right people, uh, let's look at the roles. And these are traditional roles that are mapped across this continuum represented here. Um, this isn't necessarily a view of a future state. As I would argue, you're, you'll see more overlap, increasing overlap as asset management and security operations mature. So, for example, the right tech takes you from this, Excel spreadsheets, manual data entry, um, you know, effort on the part of uh, professionals throughout technology management that uh, are obsolete as soon as they're completed. It takes you from there to here. Um, in a matter of weeks, by the way, for those of you who are not aware of what's now possible or how it all works, if Medigate, as an example, is plugged in to the right choke points on the network, we have access, we, we can see the traffic, 
all the traffic. We're plugged in before lunch and you have a picture like this after lunch. Medigate doesn't see devices that aren't connected, so a complete inventory may take several weeks. And it always takes some offline work, some device hunting, et cetera. So I don't wanna oversimplify this, but my point is you can in fact get the full device visibility, including a risk scored moving picture of your connected asset inventory. It is not a pipe dream. And importantly, it won't be a snapshot, but a moving picture where lost and missing devices are automatically found, reinstated, and reconciled. Typical early stage integrations that we see include CMMS and CMDB, which I've, I've mentioned, a move that quickly <clears throat> forces collaboration or, or joins IT, clinical engineering, and biomed. And these integrations, by the way, are often accomplished during the evaluation phase so that people can see it working. My point is getting to a game-changing level of visibility is now a well-defined tech-enabled process. There are operationalized, referenceable examples that are easily investigated. So as we continue, assessing before Medigate. Um, you know, on this front, IT and tech management staff are now able to go from a state where they are essentially disconnected from the assets they are charged with managing to a state where they have a live connection to those same assets, which are now fully profiled. They go from no knowledge of operating system or installed apps, as an example, limited visibility to unmanaged devices, which is typical, and little to no context of device re relationships with risk scoring that is largely a, a, a guesstimate. a fully connected live state that allows security posture across both managed and unmanaged devices to be assessed <clears throat> is what's delivered because risk has been scored at the device level as part of this newly delivered live inventory the assessment step happens quickly a collaborative effort that uh, for example engages security professionals biomed and clinical engineering staff is highly recommended as traditional IoT and IOMT remediation workflows are already functionally divided. Armed with detailed risk assessments spanning all devices, including automatic vulnerability correlations, meaning, uh, let's see, which devices are at greatest risk, uh, why they pose risks, and their location, um, immediate action can be taken, and progress, importantly, can be reported to management. Notably, in addition to these correlations, Medigate Auto generates the recommended remediation instruction sets. So work assignments can be quickly and appropriately distributed. At the same stage, yet another powerful integration is often considered. Um, for example, Medigate's integration with vulnerability management um, takes blind scanning of subnets and makes that practice obsolute, obsolete as we enable identity-based capabilities. Administrators can now target specific devices and device groups with full knowledge of what they are, where they're located and their current status, or they can create um, conditional exclusion lists like uh, scan all assets on this subnet except infusion pumps and any other FDA class three device. For the reasons just cited, Medigate's integration with vulnerability management enables a much higher level of scanning performance and safety, scanning performance, uh, uh, safety as well as effectiveness. And Medigate benefits as well, which is important again, getting back to orchestration, is scanning results are fed back as updates to the device risk scores held in Medigate's inventory. So put simply, the integration enables passive and active vulnerability assessment spanning both IOMT and IoT. It's a major step forward in device security risk management. Um, you know, while there are all kinds of uh, scoring frameworks that are available, uh, Medigate uh, allows um, these frameworks to be customized. Um, and that's important because what it enables at the end of the day are uh, professionals working on specific projects or 
specialists who are responsible for certain classes of equipment uh, can configure alerts that trigger uh, work orders that are only meaningful to them. So let's talk about protect here for a second. If we move from assessment or what many view as the mapping of risk, know that the state of the art now includes the automatic generation of remediation instructions and the ability to test the effectiveness of compensating controls, which is big for Biomed. The automatic creation of security policy for NAC, as an example, and the auto automatic generation of enforcement rules for firewalls is also huge. Once a device or group of devices has been successfully profiled, uh, including operating requirements, a suitable network security policy that controls the device's authorized communications can be created, it can be, they can be tested and enforced. Here's how it works. Um, device profiles and their relationships are passed to the NAC administrative dashboard, security policy baselines, uh, are auto-generated, meaning the actual ACLs, and to ensure zero disruption to clinical operations, each security policy can be virtually implemented, meaning they can be tested and compared to the observed network traffic. As required, the policies underlying rules can then be modified, and approved ACLs are then ready for real-world enforcement. It's a um, comprehensive straightforward process it's hard to consider how this stuff was done before this capability existed my point here is that outdated workflows are being eliminated and the automation being delivered creates synergies which is leverage while a biomed professional may not initially be interested in knowing that his peers who have been struggling with a network segmentation project can finally get the job done maybe one device class at a time, the impact of their success will in fact have a meaningful impact on your workflows, the biomed workflow going forward. Well, let me go back. I didn't know how many here were available. So the SOX role, in the monitoring area here is to manage cybersecurity threats. Its primary function uh, is to proactively define, I think, or identify system weaknesses. The goal is to detect, analyze, and respond to threats in as close to real time as possible. Where a good segmentation deployment can help contain a breach, uh, the SOC analyst role is to prevent it from happening in the first place and to work with Biomed to remediate any resulting damage. This is why. Medigate is deeply integrated with SIM, yet another layer of protection that benefits from the visibility it orchestrates. We maintain maps of each device's communication flows set against the knowledge base of all authorized internal and external connections. This allows us to alert when unauthorized behavior is detected. Importantly, users are able to configure alerts, as I mentioned previously, that are relevant to their specific workflow. So once again, the threat detection capability that is provided is layered cross-functionally, i.e. different users or groups of users only see alerts that are relevant to them. This protect phase requires the ability to accurately detect and respond to suspicious medical device communications. Effectiveness requires a precise understanding of manufacturer intended device behaviors and their clinical workflows, which gets back again to that enhanced understanding of what visibility needs to be. You know, in this context for Medigate, when anomalies are detected, they are correlated with intelligence from other IT sources to trace the potential attack vector. And because Medigate pinpoints a device location and can deliver its current status, Biomed and clinic, clinical engineering personnel are notified with the context that they need to respond efficiently. Let's 
So what else happens uh, in gathering and combining this information? Well, <clears throat> Medigate is also seeing um, utilization data by device. So it is able to make clinical device utilization available, in fact, uh, in real time. This adds a new dimension of insight that arguably impacts most every aspect of device lifecycle management. In addition, for example, with propagating CMMS with long missing device identifiers, Medigate is shining a spotlight on where the assets are located and details about their status as well as their usage. At a minimum, the integration improves inventory management and support of maintenance-based operational efficiencies and delivers the insights that drive smarter supplier selection processes and procurements. Medigate aggregates and translates this intelligence into recommendations. We don't just provide it uh, in, as a general uh, knowledge base. Uh, we, we do in fact make very specific re recommendations that are relevant to security, IT, biomed, and supply chain. Uh, the purpose here is to help optimize the utilization of clinical devices under each group's management. For example, Medigate has targeted specific high volume device classes that are typically um, uh, purchased and managed in fleets. I'm going to pick one here, an example that's near and dear to everyone. Uh, Medigate's developed what we refer to as an infusion pump command center that provides detailed utilization metrics that are merged with location services and peer benchmark, for example. And here's a great use case. When an infusion pump is finished infusing and satisfies, let's say, an idle time threshold determined by the, the HDO uh, to be, let's say, three hours, after that uh, threshold is hit, an alert is sent to the nearest station where a nurse or maintenance technician is notified to move the device into its restaging process. Use cases like this are accelerating restaging process, re processes by days, significantly impacting available capacity. Yet another powerful application of the insights derived from utilization data is the opportunity, as I mentioned previously, for maintenance professionals to develop alternative equipment uh, maintenance programs. While, um, as we know, legacy devices may not qualify and will continue to be um, need their maintenance on a time basis, <clears throat> the cost benefits related to switching maintenance uh, interventions on new devices from elapsed time to actual utilization are hugely significant. So I'm going to uh, end and take your questions on the following note. I started this presentation talking about the revolution in care being driven by connected health. I pointed out uh, that HDOs are feeling the pain of not having invested in operational technology and not recognized uh, that that deficit was having a direct impact on staffing shortages. But that's changing because the dots to how HDOs will be reimbursed in the future are being connected to the efficient, secure delivery of connected health. In other words, don't underestimate the power of alternative payment models. <clears throat> the shift from fee for service is inevitable and the incentive for health systems to at least begin diversifying how they are reimbursed, maybe at the beginning, uh, let's say by service line, it's already occurring. I also um, pointed out that because an integrated approach to asset management and cybersecurity is the well-recognized right path forward. It's the best practice. Traditionally siloed operations will be busted and operational convergence is going to happen. And as this happens, professional convergence is a natural fallout. Bottom line, upskilling is going to result in new hybrid roles that are a very good thing for many of the professionals in today's audience. It's an exciting time. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, go back and see uh, what the questions are that have come in, and we'll we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Tom, for a great presentation and for all of this valuable information. 
As a reminder to our audience, if you have a question for Tom, please use the question feature on your webinar dashboard and we'll take those at this time. We do have some that have already come in and we'll start with those. The first question, Tom, is can you share a little more about the business value you indicated you are measuring for clients and for prospective clients? Yeah, the business value component of this is huge because um, uh, health systems don't invest uh, where they don't see an ROI. Um, and I think I mentioned how green the field is um, uh, simply by eliminating a lot of outdated routines. Um, the automation that is being delivered, you can look at on a time value basis by job class, um, how much time is going to be saved. We can't at the same time necessarily um, indicate what we think uh, the value of reassigning professionals to more meaningful pursuit is, but we can certainly break down, we can deconstruct the existing workflows by job class and do some pretty interesting things. For example, uh, we can provide in the model that we support uh, the ability for, let's say, uh, in device lifecycle management, um, the ability to not only associate the number of minutes that are associated with tasks that are going to go away, but we can provide a way for uh, the health system to, for example, determine what they think the total impact of the technology will be and over what period of time that impact can be realized. Now, I can go deeper and deeper. The point here is that uh, it's a wasted effort if the results are not credible, that they haven't been vetted throughout the organization, that these analyses, for example, are not done on a facility by a facility basis, because not all facilities are similarly equipped. I just end by saying that if you think ROI calculations are fuzzy at best, I would argue that provided the estimated um, uh, the, the estimation procedures are agreed upon and levels of accuracy are agreed upon, then measuring ROI is no different than measuring cost. And uh, we've had a great deal of success in using our model to help um, prioritize budgeting in various areas where the health system itself believed that there was a significant opportunity to recover costs. Um, in general, if I throw something out there for you, I would tell you that uh, the payback period on investments in this capability are generally between 12 and 14 months. And over a three-year analysis term, health systems are generally uh, agreeing that they're seeing somewhere between a five and six X return on investment. Thank you. Our next question is, what do you see happening with salary levels in the industry, specifically for tech management staff? Hmm. Well, I would love to be a tech management uh, union organizer at this stage of the game. Um, I believe that uh, technology management professionals um, uh, have a tremendous opportunity, especially given the introduction of technology that's going to raise their profile in the organization based on new activities, as I indicated, more meaningful work, I think the salary levels are going to increase. And it, this goes back kind of uh, to what we, where we started in this presentation. Um, they're going to have to increase and the roles are going to have to uh, become uh, more hybrid because there isn't a near-term solution for the staffing shortages that exist. Um, there just isn't. Uh, so whether it's a combination of apprenticeships, um, um, I don't think reskilling is going to be where uh, health systems invest. I think they're going to invest in upskilling and they're going to depend a great deal uh, on their their internal departments, um, train the trainer kind of um, uh, uh, 
train the trainer kind of processes, as well as vendors to help bring uh, professionals up to speed. I will say though, um, when we talk in terms of uh, why technology is such a linchpin, um, we're getting rid of workflows um, that are outdated via automation, and we're enhancing established workflows um, by, in many cases, allowing existing tooling to perform as it was always meant to perform by providing long missing data and, and insight. So uh, I think it's really critical for folks to understand that um, as, uh, for example, tech ma technology management uh, staff is presented with these opportunities, this isn't a big training exercise and it's not a big change management effort. Uh, these improvements, these enhancements, this evolution occurs very naturally because the pain points that these folks have been feeling, Biomed, for example, has been feeling for a while now, are directly addressed and they know precisely what to do with it. So improvements happen quickly. And if we get back to salary levels, I, I just don't think that there's uh, much of a, uh, an option for health systems uh, to do anything other than recognize the increased value um, that technology management staff uh, as well as IT staff are having the role they're playing in securing connected health. All right, our next question is, for solutions like Medigate, which functional department is usually driving the tech evaluation process and who owns the budget? Who owns the budget? Um, I can answer real quickly uh, and say, I would say uh, 60 to 70% of the time, it does come out of the IT area. The, um, the other 30 to 40% of the time, and at an increasing pace, by the way, uh, it comes out of clinical engineering and biomed. Uh, we've even seen um, it, it pulled from multiple budgets because perhaps there was some urgent reason to move more quickly. Uh, to install this sort of capability, perhaps the, the HDO suffered a breach, for example, so the money just appears. But um, in terms of the first part of that question, um, I can tell you that Medigate sales process essentially insists on cross-functional participation. Um, it's, it's, this can't happen in an IT vacuum. It has to happen with the idea that clinical engineering, IT, biomed, even supply chain, get involved, understand the stakes, and understand the opportunity. Um, and what we, we push really hard in that, in that uh, area because we know whether it's during the evaluation phase or post-evaluation, um, the technology uh, provides its users a way to generate reports that are very meaningful to leadership and that generally uh, has an effect of continuing to, to drive program investment, uh, which obviously is important. Our next question is, are you seeing much evidence of outsourcing and or managed services approaches, at least as stop gaps? Yes, is the short answer, um, but um, not at the rate of adoption um, that I think many would assume, um, again, given the, the talent shortages and the efficiency at which some of these capabilities can be outsourced. I, I, nobody is doing it on a wholesale basis. You may see SOC operations outsourced as an example. Um, but what we're experiencing in what truly is a white hot market um, a marketplace where, by the way, the, you know, the traditional tech adoption curve has been dramatically compressed. What we're seeing is, um, you know, a lot of enthusiasm across teams that have traditionally not worked together, pulling together with a services partner and uh, really driving towards a program that they believe that they can support themselves. And when they hit certain gaps, as an example, then they'll 
they'll take a look at uh, a managed service option. And uh, I would say, uh, I would say more than half of the implementations that I'm familiar with, there is a managed service that is plugged here or there, but the lion's share is still being managed or taken care of by the health system itself. Now, granted, we, we do deal with health systems of all shapes and sizes and specialties, <clears throat> but more generally, we're dealing with larger health systems. And um, um, maybe it's a surprising answer, but I don't see outsourcing um, occurring at the pace that one might otherwise assume. All right, our next question is, what advice would you offer existing overworked staff for purposes of driving upskilling awareness to leadership? Oh, well, that kind of gets back to something that I just said. If you get to a point <clears throat> where you're able to uh, build the case that you should bring in um, solutions, competitive solutions to evaluate, um, I would make sure that as part of uh, that evaluation process, you get as much meat on the bone as possible, meaning uh, as many working integrations up and running uh, so that they can be demonstrated and so that uh, reporting uh, to management can occur in kind of a training uh, sort of way. Um, I know of two or three health systems uh, where security analysts were showing um, uh, leadership uh, what the security posture across various device classes was um, when they uh, installed Metagate and showed how uh, those vulnerabilities, for example, were identified, uh, work orders were assigned, and they were lowering the the uh, the risk, you know, on an incremental, very um, reliable basis. And those updates that were provided to management got them engaged in the process. So uh, I think that uh, working hard to get a, a, not just a, here it is, take a look at it, tell us what you think, but an evaluation where it's a full install, integrations are executed, and over a reasonable time frame, uh, cross-functional teams have an opportunity to really uh, use the capability report to leadership, I think that's the path forward. Thank you so much, Tom, for your time today and for a great presentation. I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor and learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit Medigate.io. A quick reminder that you can obtain your continuing education certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed to you one hour after the end of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your continuing education credit from the ACI, and you'll be able to download your certificate immediately upon completion of the survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back next week with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and for complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.